We're back. We're live. This is Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is Think Tech Tech Talks. We're talking about technology uh, with Fatih Yannick. He's a consultant for Think Tech, uh, and we'll hear more from him in a minute. Yeah, so Fatih, today, uh, uh, w- welcome to the show. Today, I, I would like to talk to you about uh, YouTube. You're, you're very well skilled in YouTube. Uh, and uh, there are things happening in YouTube and related social media that I think is uh, important that we talk about. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we uh, we saw what happened in Brazil over the weekend, and uh, the press is saying that it was all Twitter that made those guys come together. And there was a lot of misinformation and disinformation on Twitter in Brazil, uh, which fomented the unrest and was responsible in some substantial part uh, for the, um, what do you want to call it? Let's call it a disturbance, an insurrection, what have you. Um, And we know that. We know that Twitter was also important for the insurrection on January 6th here in this country. But question, is YouTube responsible also? Is YouTube a kind of social media that does similar things that is global uh, that uh, is able to and does in fact spread information uh, that is misinformation, is it? So I don't know if you could blame the platform itself, but we can definitely say that uh, there's a lot of misinformation going on in YouTube. So the reason for that is because the algorithm on YouTube decides what gets promoted and what gets on the homepage and what people watch. So the algorithm is based on what people are already uh, liking and uh, engaging with. So the more engagement a video has, the more it gets pushed to uh, the home pages of other people. And the algorithm doesn't doesn't care that what the topic of the video is or it's helpful or not. The only goal of the algorithm is to get more engagement and keep people staying on the platform. So when someone has a normal take, that's not insane, that's not crazy. It usually doesn't uh, get a lot of engagement because everyone knows that already or everyone can think about that already. But when someone has a insane, crazy take on something or a misinformation that's like a crazy uh, non-fact, it gets a lot of engagement because people are surprised. So either they're debating, oh, this is not true, they're writing in the comments, or they're watching, trying to figure out what's, how can I prove this wrong? So misinformation gets more engagement, like negativity leads to more engagement easily. Um, so, and then the algorithm pushes that more and then it goes on and on like that. There's a lot of um, uh, alt-right uh, misinformation. There's a lot of different types of misinformation on YouTube because the algorithm only cares about keeping people on the website as long as possible and making the most amount of money. So that's what happens at the end. Yeah, well, it sounds like they, they follow the, you know, the, the, that YouTube follows the same, you know, uh, uh, pattern uh, that Twitter does. They, they want to make money. They want to have advertising, what have you. Um, they, they want to engage people for as long as possible. Uh, they use an algorithm. And they don't necessarily screen out misinformation. That's the same thing as Twitter, isn't it? Yeah, the these social media web, websites they usually work a similar way. The difference with Twitter is even though they're spreading misinformation, the ad business on Twitter is really slow and really um, unsuccessful. So they're not making nowhere near the other social media platforms. Well, can we say that Google is uh, making more than anyone else? Uh... I don't know how, because for me, it's free. And for us at ThinkTech, it's a free platform. On the other hand, Google, uh, you know, it doesn't take wooden nickels. Uh, Google knows how to make money. How do they make money off YouTube? They make money online. Uh, I would say most of the money is made from ads. So it's really hard to make someone, uh, get someone to subscribe to something. So usually subscription fees, you, YouTube has this as well. They, they have something called YouTube Premium where you get YouTube without ads. It's like 12 bucks um, a month. But 
subscriptions are usually like 10 to 20 percent of the revenue for online businesses because it's much easier to make money through ads uh, in online businesses and online social media websites so they make all basically google is the king of advertising right now if, if you're on if you want to advertise on youtube or if you want to advertise on google if you have a business that's the place to go and right now facebook is trying to rival them but they have a long way to go because Google has the two uh, most used search engines in the world. Google and then YouTube is actually the second most popular search engine. So they have this advertising game kind of like uh, like pinned down uh, where they got it like so good. It's really hard to compete with Google right now in the advertising. So yeah, that premium that you talked about, that seems pretty attractive because it is a kind of a pain um, to have to go through uh, that uh, four seconds of watching an ad you don't care about and then waiting for it to uh, let you, uh, you know, click the button and move move on. Um, so uh, how much does it cost? Do you, do you recall uh, to have the premium? Yeah, I think it's like uh, $12 per personal and then maybe like, $17 and you get like a family account that you can give five people access to. Um, and it comes with uh, YouTube music and you can have uh, background playback in, uh, in your iPhones and stuff. So like if you don't have the premium, once you lock the screen, it's going to stop. Uh, you, you're not going to be able to listen to a YouTube video once you lock the screen. But if you have the premium version, you can keep listening. Um, even while the screen is locked, uh, and it comes, it has a couple other benefits as well. But it's like seventeen dollars for the family version, which gives you access to five accounts. That's per month. Yeah, per month. So <clears throat> a couple of things uh, I want to mention to you. One is I stumbled uh, into a movie, a series um, on Netflix called uh, Playlist, which is a very interesting generic term for a movie. Uh, and this is the story of a guy named Eek, E-K, who is Swedish, who uh, is a, a, a total geek who invented Spotify. And he was able to sell it, get into a deal with uh, Sony in Sweden and in, in New York uh, to buy their music. And that started, it was in the early 2000s, and that started Spotify. He is now a ridiculous billionaire this geek. And, and what is interesting, uh, and I haven't finished this movie, but I recommend it because it is a, a story of innovation. It's a story if you can't get in one door, you'll find another door. Um, and, and that's how we got to be a billionaire through in, innovating again and again and again, finding the, the parts of the market that would allow him uh, you know, to, to build his uh, music uh, empire. And of course, I think they all copied him after that, you know, that, to, to have it streaming music live um, on, on a computer, on a phone. Um, and so uh, when you talk about Google Music, I think Google Music uh, found out about this from Spotify. And the, 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 the important lesson is you have got to keep moving. You've got to keep innovating. So we should talk about innovation by, by Google and YouTube. You know, I have also noticed, uh, if I didn't mention it to you before, that on my Samsung TV, there's a button that takes you to YouTube. Uh, and this YouTube button is extraordinary because it remembers what you saw before. You know, it knows what you like. It presents to you um, movies and clips that appeal to your tastes. Um, and uh, it goes on and on and on. You know, I could sit there and watch the offerings that come to me on Samsung Smart TV uh, from YouTube all day because it's exactly what I want to hear. It's not just politics and news either. It's it's technology, it's hardware, software, anything that I have expressed an interest in. That algorithm really watches me carefully. And what is interesting also about it is that they have the ads, but the ads you can get out of very quickly. So when I compare, for example, watching the news hour and on PBS, um, you know there are very very few ads. Uh, if I watch MSNBC, there are horrendous ads. For every five minutes of content, there's five minutes of ads. Usually, you know, prescription drugs of one kind or another, but it, 
it is really obnoxious how often they play this, these ads over and over again. Same thing with CNN, same thing with BBC. But if you go uh, on um, the Samsung YouTube, you find that either there are no ads or the ads are very quick and easy to get out of. And so you don't spend five minutes for every five minutes of content. It makes the viewing experience so much better. And I and it, and it's on it's on YouTube within hours, maybe minutes after it plays live um, on the networks and on cable. So they are crowding into, um, you know, uh, the same space for me as the networks and cable have. They're really very ambitious now, and they have found a way to occupy my attention quicker and better and easier and cheaper uh, in terms of the cost of watching an ad uh, than any of these other channels. This has got to be changing the paradigm, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. We can see that with uh, night uh, shows, Saturday Night Live, uh, etc. Like back in the day, they used to not be on social media, and then they realized what, how much revenue and how much eyeballs they were missing out on. So now you can watch all the uh, late night shows on YouTube, like as soon as they come out, and even if you don't have the TV subscription, you can watch it on YouTube for free. But then again, like they get the ad uh, ad revenue from there, and um, once like one of them does it and the others realize like how much of an opportunity it is in terms of revenue and uh, and reach and discoverability it's just like a no brainer for everyone else to uh, just get in the game because they're already producing the content they just uh, it's just another distribution channel for them um and that distribution channel happens to be more um has a better uh, reach because on TV, you're scrolling through channels, like you don't know what is on each channel, and there's probably like 20, 30 channels, whatever. So you're just scrolling through them. But on YouTube, it's like it remembers what you watched before. So it just tells you, oh, like since you watched this before, like you're probably gonna watch this. So it just gives you like a direct, uh, direct send send off. Like on TV, when you're scrolling, sometimes you get kids' channels, sometimes you get like uh random stuff that you're not interested in but you still have to go through them but on youtube it doesn't give you anything on the home screen that you you're not uh th that there's no chance for you to be interested in so yeah i think it's very interesting just a digression um on the samsung smart tv youtube uh, channel there's a place where you can designate your favorite and of course i designated think tech as my favorite um, but I just wonder if you have any thoughts about how we at ThinkTech could um, could encourage, channel, expedite um, the actions of viewers of YouTube on smart TVs to make ThinkTech a favorite. How could we do that uh, in a way that it was really easy or automatic? So what we can do is we can encourage them to turn on their notification bell for our YouTube channel. So that way, when they go on YouTube, like every time ThinkTech uploads, they will get a notification and then they will know. So otherwise, it's, if it's not on their homepage and they don't go to your channel page, then they might forget about it. But if they turn on, if they turn on their notification, they will definitely know every time that you upload. Uh, that's one thing that we can do. and. Another thing is to ask people to subscribe because when you subscribe, you get it like on the sidebar, you get the subscription channels and then you get reminded of those channels. And if you click on them, then you can go to that channel directly. And subscription also increases the likelihood that a video will appear on your homepage. So if you subscribe to a channel, it, YouTube is more likely to give you that content on your homepage as well. Wow, we have to talk, Fadi. There's got to be a bunch of things we can do to channel people, no pun intended. Uh, could you do this with a QR code? Um, 
I'm not sure how you would do this with a QR code. QR code could be useful in uh, IRL, like in real life events, where we could just put up a big QR code that will ask you to, that, that when you scan it, it can do, be like a subscription link. We can do that. But other than like in real life events, I don't see a use for QR code too much. Mm, okay. So I want to, you know, follow up on the whole thing about Brazil and about, uh, you know, looking at Twitter, however, um, you know, wounded it may be because of uh, Elon Musk. The fact is that all these social media platforms are global. And except when a state actor is somehow, like China, is somehow blocking them uh, or, or, you know, there's no broadband in a given area to allow you to connect. Fact is, they're all over the world. They reach every country you can think of and they affect you know, the people in that country. And so I think to myself, well, if, if I'm Google and YouTube, I would like to get on the bandwagon there. I would like to um, have videos available using that algorithm as it may best apply in that country and uh, go through the same user experience, provide the same user experience in, in Tibet as I do in Hawaii. Um, are they doing that? And how difficult is it? And is it something that benefits them? Yeah, so this uh, really helps them increase their reach. So what they have is basically on YouTube, you can choose the language for the interface. So uh, for example, I have one account where I chose Turkish as the language. So it just it starts recommending me Turkish videos, like uh, mostly from people who are in Turkey. So they have this basically like they have like more than a hundred languages uh, and they they have this down so well that based on your where you're connecting to Wi-Fi they know where you live so they know which country which state you live in and so they recommend you stuff based on where you live so since coming to Hawaii for example I I started to see more content recommending recommended to me by the YouTube algorithm that are, that is specifically about Oahu or Hawaii. So um, as soon as you open up, even if you don't have an account from the IP address, from like how you're connecting to the internet, which cell you're using, which Wi-Fi you're using, they know where you are and your recommendations change based on where you live. So they can, because if, I'm living in America and I get recommended a Russian video. It's very unlikely for me to click. So it makes it less likely for me to stick around uh, and watch YouTube videos. So they do their best to make sure that the language is appropriate for that viewer. Um, and then that way they can maximize um, how long people stay at their website. Yeah. So what happens if you have an English program and and uh, you have a country, say Turkey, for example, that uh, where people don't necessarily speak all that much English. Um, do you, uh, I know that you can do simultaneous translation, uh, although I, I, I don't feel it's all that good on, on YouTube. Um, but what, what do you do when you take YouTube into another country, uh, a country that has a different alphabet, uh, different sounds in the language, where people will not be able to understand uh, English, for example, um, what do you do about language? You play, you play different clips, different movies, and forget about English? So one of the things that, that Google does is that since they own Google Translate, they translate the titles of YouTube videos according to your main language. So sometimes I get recommended videos that are in Turkish, like the content is fully in Turkish, but the title is translated to English because Google thinks that I'm more likely to click if they translate that title to English. Mm -hmm. So Google translates the title, but if the content is not in a language that the viewer is going to understand, then it's going to be really hard for that viewer to, um, for that channel, for that video to have high audience retention. So like the audience just going to click off to the, another video if, they, if it, it's not the language that they prefer. So this is one of the uh, this is one of the reasons that like YouTube is like global because since there's people speaking different languages everywhere, then there's people like 
creating content in different languages everywhere. So usually uh, it just gets kind of like, um, it doesn't get watched when uh, the audience doesn't have the same language as the video. It doesn't even get recommended usually. Hmm. Yeah, well, they'll probably try to avoid that by, by uh, encouraging people in that country uh, to submit videos. And I would imagine uh, that given the, um, you know, um, the, the equipment that's out there, the camera equipment, uh, it's cheap now. Uh, the webcams, uh, the software you need to, uh, you know, communicate, to stream. I imagine that the creation of, of, of uh, content um, is happening all over the world. And a good percentage, maybe a very high percent, percentage of it, is being created for YouTube to be uploaded to YouTube. It is it is the uh, the community of video for becoming the community of video for the whole world. Am I right? Yes, yes. Um, YouTube used to have a um, motto that said Bro "Broadcast yourself." So right now, there's like as of 2022, there's more than 500 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute. Okay, well, and you, sh you know it's going to go that way. But let's talk about some of the problems here. Uh, we know the algorithm, you know, is out there and uh, it l learns everything about you. And they say, they say that Google has more information about you than any other player in the market, any other uh, social media platform, anybody else who, uh, you know, take, uh, I don't know, take uh, um, IBM, take... Um, um, any of the people that you interact with, uh, they don't have as much information about you as Google, because Google keeps everything. Now, there's a, there's a creepy quality to that, because they don't tell you exactly what they're keeping, although I, I believe there's ways you can ask them, you know, what your profile looks like on Google. I, I believe that that can be done, although nobody does it. Um, but, you know, what what is the future of all of that? Um, it's like out of... Um, you know, science fiction, that they would know everything about us right down to the, the kind of beer we drink, you know, the, the kind of toothpaste we use, everything. And it's, it, you know, at some level, at least in my age group, it's creepy. Uh, is it creepy for you? Do people care about this? I mean, personally, like, I don't care about it that much because uh, the only way to protect myself from um, them getting my data is for me to not use those services. But then if I don't use those services, my life is going to be really, really hard. So I don't have an option, really. So I don't uh, care that much. But also, like, Google uh, usually has the most information, but it also depends on which services you are using the most. If you're someone who spends all their time on Facebook, you know, Facebook might have more information on you. Or if you are someone who spends all their time on um, Instagram, like WhatsApp, since Facebook owns those, then they might have more information about you. Um, so uh, this kind of like changes um, a lot based on person to person. One thing that a really interesting story, I once got a speeding ticket and I knew that that day I wasn't on that road ever. Like I, I wasn't at that state. So I went on to Google Maps on my phone, and it, uh, basically Google Maps keeps the data of where you were every day. So it was like from months ago, and I pulled it up, and I, I, I was able to prove that I was on another road another time when, that, when I got that automatic speeding ticket. So they accepted that they made a mistake, and I got out of the speeding ticket. That's great. What a great story, then. <laughs> <laughs> So there are benefits in allowing them to collect yeah. on you. But, you know, what, what strikes me is what you said suggests that every single social media that you engage with um, is collecting. They're, they're all Of collecting. course, that, yeah. that's how they make money. They sell your data. They, yeah. they own your data, and then they sell your data. There's a really uh, great quote. Uh, I like it a lot. So if the product is free, that means that you are the product. Right. I've heard that before. So the product for social media, the way they make money is from ads and selling your information. 
Yeah. So they're selling our eyeballs, our attention, and our information. So we are kind of like the product that they are selling to advertisers. You know, they're they're pretty good at uh, spotting uh, music infringement. Uh, they have algorithms. Uh, maybe it's part of one great big algorithm, but they, you know, they catch you on uh, music infringement almost immediately in minutes. Um, they're not they're not focused so much on video image uh, infringement um, or oral, you know, statements kinds of infringement. But music, they're really good at. So, you know, if that being the case, don't they have the ability uh, to find statements that are politically problematic, that that encourage violence, for example, and hate? Um, can't they manage? the content better than they are managing it because they have the technology, um, social networking technology, they call it, you know, to identify a word, a word that's on an objectionable word list and immediately take action against you. Are they doing that? Is this um, kind of technology getting more robust uh, or are they not advancing it fast enough? I think they could do more. There's two sides to this. So number one, they don't really care. Like if something is keeping people on their platform for a long amount of time, to them, it doesn't matter if it's harmful. It doesn't matter if it's true. Like they make their money by having people spend time at their platform. So for them, it doesn't matter that much. That's the, that's the number one thing. And number two, they could probably do this, but with music, there's copyright and there's uh, other problems, legal problems. Um, but otherwise, like if they they need to spend money and effort and resources on trying to uh, find these, and then they also need to decide what is harmful and what is not. Sometimes it's very clear, but to some people it's not very clear. So uh, sometimes they they might also get frustrated because whatever they do, like. Uh, if you say something is harmful, there's going to be other people that say the opposite is harmful all the time. So um, it's also hard for them as well. I, I, I criticize them a lot, but I also understand their perspective a little bit. Yeah. What about uh, applying that same kind of uh, in, you know, inquiry into the comments? Because comments uh, come on to uh, YouTube uh, galore, and some of them are they really tried. obnoxious. Yeah. That they tried, but with the comments, there's this really big problem. Let's say I wrote a really racist comment and I got banned, okay? It doesn't matter because I can just create another account in two minutes. So that's the problem that they're facing with the comment section is that it doesn't matter if you ban people. And let's say you ban keywords, right? Let's say you delete automatic delete uh, uh, slurs, okay? What people do is instead of, let's say, um, R, instead of using the word racist, they can put R and then they can put a symbol that looks like A, like at symbol, and then write the word that way, and then it won't get flagged. Like there's so many ways to go around it, and you can create so many accounts that it, it's really hard. So what they're trying to do right now is come up with a, better verification system so that uh, you can't create bot accounts and you can't create accounts easily that that are not humans or like duplicate accounts they're trying to make it harder so that it's going to be harder to comment so it, like uh, one person can only have like one account they they can do like phone number verification they can do other types of verification uh, and then give you eligibility to comment that way so that the comment section is going to be cleared up a little bit because if you know that you're not going to be able to comment with another account, you might take it more seriously. You might not want to lose your account that has the ability to comment. Yeah, it reminds me of um, the thing in China where they give you a social score. And if you break enough rules and throw enough trash on the street and you, know, you, you, you violate um, whatever the, you know, their limitations are, your social score is way down, you can't take the bullet train or anything like that, and you're going to have trouble getting a job. Um, but if you have a high social score, you do better in the society. 
it seems to me that Google, which is the leader, I, I would think, um, that Google could develop the same kind of system. And as you say, they could call for verification. You know, when I try to get on a, a site for it where I forgot my password and I go through this, you know, two-step verification business, they're, they're, they got me. They, they, they're going to be able to verify me. They're, they're going to make it, make it uh, you know, they're going to make it work so that I can't cheat on that. And or it's hard for me to cheat anyway. So I'm wondering if that's the future, Fatih. Uh, we're going to have more verification. We're going to have social scores about whether we're, we're, we're good or not. What do you think? I think for a country like USA, one of the beauties is that we have democracy. So the government changes like every two years, four years, eight years, whatever. So the government doesn't have one single set of ideas that they force on people all the time. Since there's more than one party, more than one leader. In China, they, they don't have democracy. So they can say the government can define a set of principles and then have that go on, like make that score, like the social score based on that. But here, I don't think it's possible because another president is going to come and they're not going to have the same same idea about everything because everyone has freedom of speech. So it's going to be really hard to make something like that here um, because of the fact that we have democracy and everyone speaks their minds and there's like an open uh, debate um, uh, platforms and stuff. Okay, well, let me, let me take that one step further. I do want to ask you this. So we know the power, which can be toxic, of social media. We know that social media can foment an insurrection here or in Brasilia. Uh, it can be very dangerous to democracy, which is the, the fabric on which we all like it or not, which we all live. Uh, and which is better for the, you know, the liberal world order everywhere. But social media can bring that down if it's misused and, and not moderated and so forth. <clears throat> so isn't it inevitable that, I hate to even think this, but isn't it inevitable that government has to get involved, that these guys have to be regulated? The stakes are so high. The risk is so great. You know, the potential damage is so destructive that after a while you say to yourself, gee, they could wreck the country, the world. Um, do we need regulation? And how do we do regulation in a way as, so as not to give so much license to government that they wreck it from their side? I mean, that's a really complicated question, honestly. And one of the things about these companies is that Google, Facebook, these are public companies. So one of the advantages of them being a public company is that they care about their bottom line. So they're going to be, they're going to be scared and they're going to be conservative uh, in what they do. And they don't want to stir the pot too much because if they get into a lot of controversies, if they, if they mess something up really big, then their shareholders, like they're not going to let them do whatever. Um, because they care about being profitable uh, or at least like revenue growth and stuff like that. So uh, they're kind of like scared because they want to keep their money. So that's one uh, security that we have for these companies. But then again, Twitter just went private. So that doesn't exist for Twitter anymore. Twitter could be unprofitable for 10 years and no one would be able to question it. But the government involvement is go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, the government involvement question is, I think, very complicated. Um, I don't know if I could answer that question because this is this is a really big debate, and how much should the government be involved? Like, it's it's really hard to answer. Mm -hmm. Well, I I think the answer is going to be a non-answer for a long time until it gets so serious that there must be an answer, and then who knows what will happen. For now, I, I suggest to you that uh, the people in Congress, A, are not interested, and B, if they were interested, they wouldn't really understand the stakes. They wouldn't understand the technology. 
they wouldn't understand the social implications of social media. And so they're not about to actually form up a, some policy on that. That's my thought. Um, but let me ask you about one other thing before we quit, and that's this. Google was established, and I remember it well, uh, out of nowhere on a, a search search algorithm, that they had this, the smartest search algorithm. And other people had search algorithms, too. I'm reminded of Bing. Remember Bing? Uh, <laughs> what's that? Yeah. Um, Microsoft, is it? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, Microsoft. No longer of any real interest. Um, but uh, and Yahoo, I think. Yeah, yeah, Yahoo too, yeah. My, and whatever the other guys did, they have faded into you know, obscurity or oblivion. Um, but Google gets better and better. And um, I, I think to myself that that is such a big selling point for anybody in any language who wants to submit, you know, and upload videos and, and to find them and to allow um, his or her followers to find them. This is a real important issue. So my question to you is, um, you know, is, is Google and YouTube significantly better in finding things now than it was before? I mean, are they continuing to work on this? Have you noticed an ability on YouTube to find things quicker, better, smarter than it was, say, five years ago? Is this still a leading area of innovation for them? I think this is, they're still uh, leading the innovation, but they know how much power they have, and they know, like YouTube knows they don't have competition, like Google knows they don't have competition. So one of the things that that leads to is that they increase advertisement. So if you remember, like back in the day, 10, 15 years ago, when you search something on you, Google, you would get whatever you search, you would, that, the first page would be full of different websites that you, uh, whatever you searched about. But right now, like half of the first page is ads about what you're searching. So they're increasing the ads. The YouTube is doing this as well. Back in the day, YouTube didn't have a lot of ads because they were trying to grow out the company. They were trying to grow out the revenue. They, they were scared of their competitors. Right now, they don't have any competitors. So when you search up something and you don't have the premium account, there's like a, like a 99% chance that there will be one or two ads, like um, sport, sponsored videos above whatever you searched about. So I think that's increasing more and more and that that's making it a harder and less comfortable experience for users. Because if I'm searching something on Google, I just want to get what I'm searching on. I don't want to get ads about what I'm searching on. You know? That's a really important point. So you know that uh, ThinkTech uses FileMaker, which is an Apple product. Um, and um, it's very powerful database. And it's very easy to program in that database, including with script and lots of finding functions, okay? So if I have a, a, a database of millions and millions of records, and I wanna slice and dice that and find anything and everything uh, that meets a, a whole series of parameters, I can do that on FileMaker very easily. Not the only one, but we are familiar with that. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I can create a page, a layout, uh, in FileMaker uh, to find anything that ThinkTech has ever done. Any, any person, any date, any subject, the use of any word, you know, social, social uh, you know, analysis. Now, I can't do that um, on, on YouTube. On YouTube, you put it in the search box, you put a few words in, and that's it. And it, it may catch it or not. And I'm, I'm wondering two questions for you, Fatih. One is, am I missing something? Is there a, a programmer interface here that can be used on YouTube to make a more sophisticated search? Is this where Google and YouTube are going? Because I think there are people out there who would like to do on YouTube what we do on FileMaker. And the second question is, um, how can ThinkTech avail itself of a more sophisticated search capability on YouTube, which is our main engine of uploads and storage. Your thoughts? 
So one of the things that YouTube uses for making search easier is tags and uh, keywords in the description. So if you focus more on making those tags and keywords uh, and putting them in the description in all of the videos, it's going to be easier for YouTube to pick them up when we search about them because otherwise YouTube is going to look at other things like for example sometimes they look at the auto generated subtitles like transcript of the video but that's not always accurate like you might say a word but since the uh, voice to uh, writing is not perfect it's not, it's not like 100% accurate so it's it makes it easier for youtube to search when you put like tags and keywords in it um and uh, I think that would be a that would that could be a solution towards this problem. Well, you know, um, if, if I have the ability to uh, manage a database, I can say I want to know uh, every show uh, that Fatih Yannick was involved in um, between April first and April fifth of um, you know twenty eighteen, for example, and uh, and then I want to know those shows that didn't have Jay Fidel in them. Um, and I want to know the shows that dealt with um, mm -hmm. Apple rather than Google. In other words, I could have positive search search terms, negative search terms, date search terms, spelling, and as you yeah. referred to before, I could have I could have various words uh, where, where there is a misspelling, and I could be looking for those misspelled words as well. I can't do that on YouTube right now. Uh, even if I put in a lot of keywords, I'm never going to get close to that. And I'm wondering yeah. if, that, if that's the future. And if it is, is that something that we can, uh, is that an opportunity for us and others who are similarly inclined at having a more powerful search on all those, what did you say, 500 hours? Uh, 500 hours per minute, yeah. Per minute. There's a lot, lot going in there, and it's, it's, you know, it's huge. It's in the trillions, I expect, already, and they're going faster every day. So I want to be able to find stuff easier. I, I don't want them to manage my, my searches. I want to be able to cross-cut and slice and dice in every way possible uh, into their database. Is that, is that going to be available to me? Right now, uh, YouTube hasn't announced something like that. And I, I understand what you're saying. YouTube has like their search, like advanced filters, but the filters that they have are not like uh, as advanced as uh, as you mentioned. Like they, you can sort by upload date, or you can say, "Oh, show me videos under four minutes or uh, long, or like there are like more than twenty minutes." But it's like very limited in capacity. And you can't give like from this date to this date. You can only say like today or this week, you know, like it's very limited. Um, maybe uh, using those advanced features on Google search uh, could help, but then you, you might get non YouTube related uh, answers as well. So maybe this could be something that YouTube could improve upon um, in the next uh, years, decades. Well, I, you know, I was going to say we should send them a copy of this uh, this video, uh, maybe give them an idea. But in fact, by uploading it, we are sending a copy of this video. So maybe they'll take a look, Fadi, and they'll they'll learn from our suggestions. Anyway, thank maybe. you very much for, <laughs> for this you. conversation, uh, Fadi Yannick, uh, hey, uh, who who consults with us on uh, YouTube and Google and other things at Think Tech, and who is a a student at the Academy for Creative Media at UH. Thank you so much, Fatih. Thanks. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, Please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.